Greetings, this is uh, 2nd of December of 2023. Galavanov uh, stream with Alexey Rostovich, uh, stream number 21. Let's try it again. Previous one didn't work out. So, yeah, I think it'll work today. Alexey, first question. What will happen with Alpha and Omega channel? What are your relations with Romanenko? What's relation between SBU and Poroshenko? What's flying over Krasnodar? And a whole bunch of other things that people have sent us in the form of questions. But before we go into all that, please do not forget to click subscribe button to Alexis' channel, to my channel, and of course to the privateer station if you are listening or watching that in English language. What do we start with? Whatever you want to. Okay, let's start with SBU, the investigative organs of Ukraine that got some information about uh, provocations being prepared by Russia. The main purpose of these provocations is to lower the support of uh, foreign allies and to also try to break the society from within the Ukrainian society. And in light of this information, the meeting between party leader of one of the part, Ukrainian parties, Peter Poroshenko, with uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary is actually one of the elements in this chain. And Orban is a known friend of Putin, who is also very vocal about removing sanctions from Russia. And Russia was planning to use this meeting in order to continue um, intel and psychological and information warfare against Ukraine. So basically, summing it up, our intel services are accusing Poroshenko in uh, being a Russian agent. Funny enough, when he was in power, when he was a president, he was accusing everybody of being a Russian agent, including, by the way, uh, president of uh, Georgia, uh, who is now in being in jail, kept in jail and tortured there in Georgia, also being a Russian agent. Um, I think Poroshenko in this case uh, has a case, uh, has met a quick karma, and that's one thing. But the other side is, this is actually our problem. The fact that the leader of one of the opposition parties is not being let out of the country, that is a problem. I don't like it. I don't like the situation of it. Uh, also, when it happens right on the eve of uh, voting, probably voting in December in the United States on the budget for Ukraine, and all the media now will be covered in the information about Ukraine not letting its uh, president out, right? Yeah, there is no such a formulation in Ukraine as ex-president. We actually, once a president, always a president. And of course, Alexei, I'm not a fan of uh, Peter Poroshenko. Uh, exactly, me neither. But still, uh, his official title is he is a president of Ukraine from 2014 to 2019, and he's not being let out of the country. I think this is strategically a huge mistake. As for Ukrainian security services, SBU, I can only feel pity for the people, for the officers who were forced to compile this whole story about uh, Poroshenko's visit. So do you think that angle of everybody being Russian agent will be pushed further by Ukrainian security services? Well, yes, uh, Vasil, uh, it, um, it seems to be a bane of all presidents. They all start with, let's make new friendship with Moscow, and they end up with everybody's a Moscow agent. And probably the uh, last the last breath of each president is when Bankova Street is uh, the shining city on the hill, and around that street uh, everybody is a uh, Moscow agent. The problem they have is, why does Ukraine then fight against Moscow defending, right? And who, if everybody is Moscow agents, what will be defending Bankova Street? Well, okay, so you've defended uh, Farion before, right, in her statements. No, not at her personally. I'm not defending Farion, Poroshenko, and Dubinian and others. I'm defending the principles. If we are building a country where we can accuse a congressman being an agent of a Moscow, and we can put him or her in jail and then return out with broken ribs, then I don't think we need such a country. Why are we fighting for it? 
Well, I'm not sure if he is detained yet. Right. Let's say this morning I got some unofficial confirmations that uh, the case is going. The problem is that we are fighting against it, right? We are supposedly fighting for freedom against all these uh, things. And now we have some pro-presidential units actually jumping for joy and giddily smiling and saying, hey, you know, good for, good for us that we got Poroshenko. Well, just wait. The, then your turn will come too. Because it never stops at the opposition. The problem with legal system, if you start it once against somebody, it will work against everybody else. These situations should not be happening against anyone and anybody in the country. Because if a person is a traitor, then, and indeed there is a body of proof around it, there is a certain uh, article in the criminal code, especially for a congressman, because it makes it even harder a crime for the congressman. And especially during the war, the punishment is heavier. And especially for the congressman, because of the high caliber uh, bureaucrats, when they commit a uh, basic crime, even if it is uh, some sort of administrative crime, especially during war times, uh, it's considered to be aggravating circumstances that they are bureaucrats of a higher caliber uh, while committing these uh, crimes. So he would, if he real, is a real traitor, he would get 25 years just for that. But the country where the congressman is not being let out on just blank accusations, or when he is actually being detained and being illegally detained or without enough proof and perhaps even beaten up and those while detaining, um, this, will, this will get to all of us. This is wrong. So look, the country where you have these practices is the country that lost to Russia, even if the country had reached the borders in 1991. Alexei, you'll be getting some pushback that this, these are the conditions of war. Maybe after war it should be different. No, Vasil, the human rights, they either exist or they don't. Even prisoners of war have human rights. Those people who shoot at you have human rights. And we either are defending human rights or we're not. And the slogans, let's uh, wipe our butt with constitutions because it's war. You know, I know one country that it does exactly that. Then why are you fighting with this country if you like it so much? And some people are getting upset in the chat because I've seen uh, there was also a video of uh, Russians shooting some of the prisoners of war whom they initially wanted to capture and then uh, save their lives and then they just uh, execute them. And we instead uh, give them coffee and cookies and they sit and wait uh, to the end of the war. And no, that's exactly the problem, Vasil. We are we. Them are them. We're doing it differently. If you really like their practices, then why are you fighting with them? Just join in ecstasy together and be one big entity. Where are you, Alexei? Um, yeah, I'm in New York. It's evening on your side, and it's only 8 minutes past 2 p.m. here. Okay, guys, uh, by the way, post something in the chat. Let us know where are you watching this uh, stream from. I'm in Kiev. Alexei is in New York. Tell us where you are. A lot of questions about Alpha and Omega channel, right? You, I think, understand in what context. Right, in the context of Nikolai Feldman and Yuri Romanenko, um, indeed, they have a uh, falling out between themselves. I am in good relations with both. I'm not going to choose one against the other. So I am doing War Diary with Nikolai. And Yuri right now is trying to start a new channel with the main accent on uh, deeper dives, just like uh, Friday deep dives that we had. Right, Romanenko has his own channel, right? Yeah, yeah, he, he does have a channel, but he is setting up a hardware for his studio, and he's just wanting to dive deeper into the commentary of leading think tanks and some philosophy aspects and all. So I'll be gladly visiting his studio as well. Okay, about Krasnodar, if you have any information, what's flying there, what's being shot down there, I'm not quite sure what's uh, flying there. I suspect by the information that I'm looking at, that's probably some UAVs, but it's such a situational minutia that I don't think it's worthy of our stream to discuss that. You guys can talk to other experts uh, whom you consider experts in this uh, field. You can talk to them which drone hit which house. Okay, um, let's, let me tell you one story I was preparing for the stream that I noticed. 
Бахмут, civilian construction management company wants to buy a truck with a crane and it needs to be done by December of 23 and I just raised an eyebrow Bakhmut is occupied right <laughs> yeah yeah Vasily some optimists who think that will completely deoccupy the area and by the end of December right Fantastic. Yeah, these are people who totally believe that we will get to the borders of 1991. We should be supporting them, I guess, right, and not attacking them in our streams. So this is the true belief in victory. That's uh, all, all that uh, propagandist fakery that's being inflated against reality. Yeah, I would suggest we should also order something for Lugansk, for Donetsk, or for Simferopol city management, why they are not participating in our tenders in Ukraine, for example, resurfacing the stadium in, in Simferopol. They could have uh, fundraised uh, millions for that. Um, what do you mean by the word Lubok that you use? We use uh, propaganda translate, uh, word propaganda in translation. But um, historically Lubok is uh, a genre of very simple pictures that historically in the Russian Empire, when they were drawing Cossacks in you know, 1814, when he would be um, poking with his pike uh, five or ten Germans and the other small figures of Germans are running away and he's like a big giant there and the Germans are very little like cockroaches uh, representing the wars of that time. But yeah, this was the genre that was supposed to depict Ukrainians as gods and the enemies as the non-existing little creatures. So that's what our propaganda is inflating up. And that's why I call it Lubok. Um, those people who believe in it, they will eventually smack head on in a wall when, with reality when it hits. But yeah, that, that's why we're trying to fight it. Okay, more questions from people who sent them from different, play, different cities uh, during this week. So, Alexei, why are there no public executions for corruptions in Ukraine? What is, uh, what do they mean by public execution for corruption? Did we change in our criminal code? Some people like uh, swift justice, but here's the problem. You either follow the letter of law or you follow the revolutionary needs and uh, do swift justice. But uh, these two pathways are very different. And the exit is going to be very simple from this situation. We either make our justice system work, so it actually works and punishes people uh, who need to be punished, or one moment they actually will boil up to the level of revolutionary uh, swift justice. And by the way things are going, I'm still thinking that there probably will be some sort of uh, revolutionary situation in Ukraine rather soon. Well, speaking of uh, swift justice, remember, in uh, some people are saying in Germany they were executing some people who are not buying tickets for public transport. Oh, you want like uh, Germany? Uh, by the way, a curious fact, Germany was one of the fully uh, where German judicial system was fully functioning. There's usually uh, some difference between real and judicial fields, but uh, in Germany there was no difference actually. They were very to the letter. Uh, but uh, the question is, is that what you want? Do you want everything to be by the letter or do you want to have some mercy on occasion? I think, in general, our problem is that we need to set the system that works and prevents corruption. Otherwise, at some point, there'll be some revolutionary boil-off and some crisis boil-off when uh, heads will roll. And, you know, unfortunately, our system is in deep trouble because when we're starting building defense lines at the second uh, year, end of the second year of war, that's a good indicator. Because if we had Surovikin lines, the defense lines like uh, Russians built, our losses would have been 50% lower. Half of our dead soldiers would still be alive. And Russian losses would have probably doubled. So why are we doing it just now? Don't care about people? What's the motivation? Okay, Alexei, by the way, in the news recently it came out that uh, the order indeed was sent to start building fortification lines on all of the directions and all the parts of the front. What is it? Is it strategic defense? It is, of course. And remember a couple months ago when I started talking about strategic defense, how some of our uh, influenced by propaganda were screaming and throwing uh, poop at me for bringing up this matter, that we should be still fighting and uh, 
liberating territories, why don't they run now and attack their top leadership? Okay, let's go further. Alexei, are you for a dual citizenship? Yes, for dual, triple, quadruple, whatever. Um, let's add a little bit more philosophy here. Modern government, modern country is a rather ineffective at its core. At best, it can be minimizing evil for its citizens because modern country is the product of a disciplinary society and disciplinary society is based on fear and control. So any organization based on that can either increase uh, fear and control or can uh, decrease fear and control. It cannot do much else be beyond that. So when you add dual citizenship or more citizenship options, that actually allows people some leeway from the power of the government. It allows them some breather to have uh, an option. And just look at the his history of our country. Right now, at the beginning of this century, we probably had 18 million living abroad. Now it's probably closer to 26 million, so almost as much as are living now in the country. And we definitely would appreciate dual citizenship so people could have choice where to live. So what do you estimate how many people, how many Ukrainians uh, live now abroad? Well, before the war, we had something like 18 million people who consider themselves or identify as Ukrainians in Canada, in Germany, in the United States. And there is a mix of different uh, waves of Im immigrants there. First wave, second wave, early 90s. And with war, there are probably another 9 million who left, and at least 6 million still remain over there. Uh, so that's current situation, close to 25, 26 million abroad. What about inside Ukraine? Oh, that's a difficult and interesting question. Why aren't we doing the public census since 2001? And why do you think we're not? Well, I think there is a reason for that. I think there is a lot of things that are being written off for so-called dead souls who don't exist, who left, but who may still be around on paper. And that's part of that uh, corruption of the, our government system. So let's, uh, we can do some rough calculus. We had 36 millions before the war, nine left, maybe two millions came back. So we have 29 millions roughly, maybe 26, 30 millions approximately. Okay. Have you met people in politics, Alexei, of your blood type, of your belief systems? In Ukrainian? Yeah, we have a few. In the world politics? Uh, yeah, I've met a few. Very few, but they do exist. How do you think the situation is unfolding around Zaluzhny? Not only Bezugla statements, but in general, that whole machine is getting some steam. Where do you think it will lead? It will lead to extraordinary measures being used to resolve that situation. And let me unwrap it a little. Extraordinary measures, I mean either Maidan 3 or military coup, or some people uprising, or maybe suddenly, if our power will all of a sudden decide to change the way they're doing things and set up the coalition government of uh, national rescue or something. Or elections, that's the fourth variant. But it's military times and elections is still an extraordinary event because they're being organized in an extraordinary situation. So that can also be calculated as extraordinary. Problem is that situation has reached the level that even the most unwitting, unwilling citizens of our country are starting to suspect that something is wrong. And now they're starting to look for who's guilty. And according to Mariana Vizugla and David Arachamia, Zaluzhny is the guilty part. And of course, they also added Boris Johnson because uh, he was responsible for everything bad in our external politics. Or there was, uh, at least they insinuated that Johnson is responsible for us not signing the Istanbul agreements. Well, maybe not fully guilty, oh, right, not fully guilty, but one of the main reasons. And because of him, we went to, the, to war that uh, actually led to death and wounding of at least 300,000 civilians and military people. And Zaluzhny is guilty because he is not using our army properly. And he failed with counteroffensive, after which everything is even worse. And he didn't even produce the battle plan for 2024. 
the funniest part of that is that the battle plan is not even his responsibility, not even Ministry of Defense responsibility. It is the product of Cabinet of Ministers and is to be signed by President. In October of 22 was the first uh, document that was signed, and the President signed it back then in, on the 24th of February. If they need a new one, they need the Cabinet of Ministers to work on that. So military responsibility is very minimal in that document. They only provide some parameters of the operation that need to be conducted to reach the goals that are set by that plan. And 70% is on cabinet of ministers. And by the way, Mariana Bezugla is asking the right questions about things happening uh, with Ministry of Defense and in Army, but she's asking them not in the into the right department. These are questions not to Zaluzhny, but to the cabinet of ministers and to the president. Also about mobilization, these are local powers and cabinet of ministers, but they throw stones at Zaluzhny. So the question is, if she as a vice uh, chairman of the Committee of National Security doesn't know the law th that they have adopted, or they do know and they just uh, deciding to pursue it this way, I'm not sure which option is worse. Do you think it's Mariana's personal initiative or she's being pushed to do that by somebody. Well, I know Mariana and David personally, and Mariana, I think she indeed, uh, she aches for the country. What's surprising to me is that she's not uh, going then via the right pathway, because she's supposedly, she's supposed to know the right pathway, right? I actually posted on my social the law of, uh, the, the legal constraints uh, of uh, Minister of Defense, paragraph two describes who is doing what there, so it's pretty straightforward that it's not on them. So what she is demonstrating with the section is that she really aches for Ukraine, but then she is what unprofessional and doesn't want to understand who is responsible for what. That mobilization, construction of defense structures, and fortifications and logistics, all that this is not commander in chief. This is minister of defense and uh, cabinet of ministers. Commander in chief can only use troops and resources that he is given by Ministry of Defense. So he is basically defining the parameters of the operations he needs to do, carry out, in order to follow with the plan prepared by Ministry of Defense and Cabinet of Ministers. So even preparation for war, it's also not Commander-in-Chief, that's Minister of Defense. And I remember at the beginning of our streams, you also mentioned that even the Euro, their responsibilities are not separated in our legal system. That's correct, and that's my only qualm with her. I understand her position, that she really aches for our country and she is uh, doing it truly. But that will and that ache should be converted into actually adopting the documents that would define the responsibilities or separate responsibilities. I think it's been around for two over two years now there in uh, Congress. It was uh, presented there even before the war. She is not a spy, she is not a scoundrel who is fighting a vendetta against Zaluzhny, and she is not the person mo who most likely will not follow with anybody else's commands. As far as I know, she was always arguing with President and with many other lead figures when she was disagreeing with them. But uh, the problem is that she is actually missing the target, rather bluntly, because she, I don't know, didn't read the laws that she adopted, being the Vice Chairman of Security Committee. So another question is, who is running our country in war times? Remember, I brought up the question in September in an interview with you about the competence of our leadership, who is running the country, after which I actually started having Ukrainian security services coming to my home address, uh, trying to find me there, and then my administrators uh, getting their phones hacked by security services. and. That's what we have, right? And they have such a blunt incompetence. They're also talking about the plan of war and the plan of defense. Plan of war doesn't exist. Maybe people, some, some people thought that after Mariana and David mentioned a plan of war in one of their uh, statements, there is no such document as plan of war. There is a plan of defense. And this uh, incompetence is coming from the vice chairman from the Security Council. This is bad. So you did mention that somebody visited your home in Kiev, right? 
what happened there? There was a police visit who tried to bring me, I don't know, to interrogation or something, doing investigative activities uh, to find me in my Kiev address. But as my neighbors told me, yeah, they were there. So I never saw them. Okay, those people who are writing glory to Ukraine in the chat, glory to heroes and traditional thank you to our defense forces so that we can actually do these streams and function as a country because they are defending us with their lives on the front lines. And you can ask more questions. I have some that I can still ask here. Is there another fundraiser that you want to mention? Yes, we do have one. I'm sorry, I jumped into our stream straight from an educational seminar that I was leading. So we'll do that after. After the stream, it'll be under the video. And I just send that uh, request to all our, our viewers. Please go check the link and support as much as you can. Because the main cornerstone of our existence today is our soldier who is well equipped and uh, has enough uh, resources to fight the war on the front. And by the way, military, uh, the, all, the, all the soldiers, all the officers are sincerely sending their thanks to you. They're thanking not me or Vasil, uh, they're sending thank you to you guys because we're fundraising money to their cards. And that's probably the best and cleanest way to support them directly. Right, Alexei. I'm actually still doing fundraising with a charity fund, but I'm thinking I'll jump into the same system as you do, so it goes directly. Okay, here I got some note from my admin. The 14th uh, detachment of uh, Ukraine military, it is the first UAV detachment of our army. Very successful in using UAVs of different uh, radius and different uh, models. Th these are one of the most successful detachments using the UAV systems to destroy enemy forces. They travel a lot. They travel uh, along the whole front line. They work from Kharkov to Kherson. They're not working in one sector. You can imagine how much wear and tear do their vehicles get. And they raising some money for their cars. Um, and again, their vehicles are also not uh, new ones to start with. They're also volunteered uh, vehicles to them and donated. And plus also the enemy is working on them. When you are sending FPV drones, they're also sending FPVs at you. And uh, sometimes they hit landmines. So yeah, they're raising a little bit uh, for vehicle repairs. And I know them personally, so please uh, chime in, donate a little to that detachment. And that is going to be posted under under that video on our channel. All right, when they when they give you details, yeah, we'll put that in the description of the video. On my channel, on Golovanov channel, I'll put the link to your Telegram so people can go there right now. But uh, after this video airs, we'll put the link to that. And on my personal channel, on Vasil Golovanov's channel, you guys will see a link to another a fund that is raising more money for Mavic drones and will report for, uh, for every hryvna that we spend at the end of it. But I'm thinking we'll probably switch to what Alexei is doing. Yeah, exactly, Vasil. This is the simplest. You avoid accusations that you're doing anything with this money. You just send money directly to the troops. All right. That's good. The moment we get this information, tell us more. Next question from viewers. Alexei, can you become again Alexei that we loved, that you were for the year and a half, now as if there is some black demon inside you? Um, what happened? Guys, I'm doing the same thing as I was doing at the beginning. At first we had to keep our society psychologically so we don't lose. And today we need to win over that lubok, that propaganda that uh, is disconnected with reality. Because the best way to lose is to run far and wide against the reality. All these motions will be punished by history. The main task, in my view, for people who have an influence is to bring people to reality. So I have the same intention that we win. But right now, since the situation changed, the form changed. I am just as I was at the beginning. And I'm still aiming at us finding ways to win. Because initially, just I had to support us, and now I need to find ways uh, that are actual in the current situations to win. All right, you 
know that people like when they're being supported, right? Well, there are different situations, I see. And I wasn't really too honeycoating them. I was telling about uh, Russians when they were breaking through, when they were capturing things. Just remember when I was talking from the Tribune in the office, I was telling about them hitting Kiev, about us being surrounded, surrounded uh, here and there and us fighting. So I, I had an intent for us to win, but I was bringing situation the way it was. I was just supporting the morale of our people and troops. And now the intention is a little different. Now our intention is not to lose, and this is my main task. I don't think we can really talk about victory at this moment, but at least not to lose. And it's nice to be a sweet uh, soothsayer and uh, tell everybody that we, we are strong, we are best, we will win. But then when you hit the reality, the hit will be tougher and stronger and it will be more devastating. So I'm not doing it. So why don't we exchange attacks of drones? They send 25s, we send 25s. Well, because we're ineffective in military production. They're beating us in this. It's very simple. They made these decisions over a year ago to sharply intensify the production of drones, and we didn't. And there is a, a guy, uh, an economist, Alexei Kush. He has his post where he is going through measures taken by Russian Federation to produce drones. You'll be horrified when you read through all of them. We don't have anything like that. Because we failed to take these measures, and they did. And Look, Russia and Putin made four strategic important decisions. First one, he made a decision to break the dependency on the West, including mental dependency, because he was very pro-Western early on. He was the first one to call Bush after 9-11 terrorist act and offered his help. American military had the base on the territory of Russia and was flying to Afghanistan through Russia. It was like a honeymoon of uh, two countries. The West uh, offended Putin, or so he thinks, and Putin still had his uh, head way deep in the West, and he was trying to be liked by the West. Now, I think, it looks like they found immense strength internally and started to break this mental dependency on the West to stop being liked by the West, that need to be liked and appreciated. So, when you're laughing that they're generally going to the east, it's not funny. When they really break their dependency on the west, that's when they will become really wild. Right? Like an avatar, they manage to pull those connecting links, um, stop being liked by the western civilization. Second is that they manage to change geostrategic frame, and they posted it as global west and global north against the global south and global east. And they got rather strong allies there. Yesterday, Steinmeier from Germany, when he visited Qatar, he was not met at, on the tarmac for 30 minutes. They said that uh, it was some miscalculation protocol, but this is a spit in the face, because uh, Germany supported Israel. Qatar made this demarch. What did Germany do? Nothing. They just wiped the spit off. What did uh, Russia do when they visit Qatar? I think when uh, last time one of their functionaries visited, he almost got a horse parade and the fanfare and everything. So they are pushing their agenda. Russia made uh, a third one is a huge effort to circumvent the sanctions, and they made uh, half a trillion trading oil, gas around the sanctions and uh, other resources. 550. Are you sure that's the right number? Yes, that is the right number. They avoided uh, all the sanctions and all the electronics and the shahids that are flying on our heads. That's Western electronics. And they're also deploying their own military production. They have rather serious plans in a military industrial complex. And um, ramping it up, they generally are avoiding the total failure on the front. And even in the current condition, they still have uh, more guns and more tanks and more armor vehicles on the front. Now, if we go further, they're also building some factories in Central Asia. One of them is a steel factory for their armored equipment. Another will be assembly factory. And recently there was an interesting information that Kyrgyzstan increased uh, the imports of all the high-tech goods for uh, over 100% year over year. Why do you think that happened? 
And fourth, they managed to solve the problem of mobilization. They have about 40,000 people coming to conscription sites monthly uh, as volunteers. Not, not fully, I mean, they're giving the money, but still they come at their own volition. They don't have to hunt them down. And these decisions made at the end of the first phase of war, when they suffered huge defeats, when they lost their army, their regular army, and they figured how to change that long term. And we, in our propaganda euphoria, we did not make these decisions, and we hoped and relied on the West, and the West never was actually going to defeat Russia. So the war brought us two interesting discoveries. That first, that Russia turned out to be a naked king, second army of the world, who is, uh, you know, was always threatening to go to English Channel, but they had no resource. But at least they made right motions for themselves. And we're laughing at them that they're like a drug user after getting off the drug. But indeed, they got off the drug and they feel real bad now, but they got off that needle. And we are, and we have gotten on the worst needle in that time. And we've gotten on the needle of those who are the second naked king. Just look at the situation somberly. All NATO altogether cannot produce a million artillery shells in 12 months. And North Korea not only makes it, but also transfers them to Russia. Whole NATO and North Korea. Well, Alexei, the fact that they're not giving it to us doesn't mean that they don't have them. Vasil, they indeed don't have them. Well, they are expecting other conflicts. Why do they want, maybe, maybe they don't want to give us everything. No, 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 Vasil, that's worse. The whole NATO can produce 300,000 artillery shells of 155 millimeter caliber. And, you know, people who are working on these factories, they're older generations on the machinery of made in 1970s. Good luck gathering new people, you know, youngsters to work on these shells now. Maybe they can, but not at the moment. Now they're laughing at Russia losing 350,000 at war. But I have a question. Is NATO ready to lose 100,000 at a war for their ideals and their political ideas? Why NATO needs to think about that? Because NATO is threatening China, they're threatening Iran, they're threatening Russian Federation. Why don't they think about that? And I'll bring you another example. How long did NATO and the United States fight against the global terrorism? Probably 20 years, right? 22 years since 2001. On the 23rd year of fight against terrorism, Hamas attacks Israel and starts with an act of political terrorism. And what do we hear? Everybody, including Biden, who were fighting with terrorism for 22 years, now they are pushing on Israel to sit down and negotiate with uh, Palestinians to give them a certain political concessions. What does it mean? It means that political act by the terrorists of Hamas actually was fruitful. And now Israel, one of the strongest countries with their nanotechnologies, space technologies, military and all, they're losing at the pressure of the West. Biden himself is pushing Israel to make sure to sit down and create a Palestinian state. This is the result of Hamas attack. Well, yeah, Palestinian state, but without Hamas, right? But a Palestinian state, this is the goal that Hamas was put on their, has put on their banners. Well, Israel did have some relations with the Gaza sector. They had some settlement, right? Yeah, but at large, look at this picture. People are saying they're fighting with political terrorism. And then at the end, 22 years in, they're saying, yeah, let's follow the, or what these political terrorists did. They requested these things, but there are difficulties. Let's sit down and negotiate. Right? Wait. Wait, Alexei. How? Who is saying that uh, we need to follow what terrorists request? Biden is saying that. The, the goal of Hamas was to create a Palestinian state. And that's what we're now forcing Israel to do. Palestinian uh, mandate was created by United Nations in 1948 when they announced the creation of Jewish and Arab, or how they called it, Palestine state. After which there was a series of events and Palestinian was never created. Then in the 70s, Organization of Freedom of Liberating of Palestine, they actually uh, headed by Arafat to create such a, a state. And there were certain agreements written in Camp David and Oslo, for which Ishak Rabin uh, paid with his life. 
because an extremist killed him. And then there was a difficult transformations of fat fighters into Palestinian administration. And it existed with uh, different uh, levels of success, fighting with Hamas and Islamic Jihad up until 2017. In 2017, Hamas won on uh, in sector Gaza, was uh, throwing Fatah uh, leadership out of the windows of the buildings. And uh, that uh, current administration was actually supported by Israel. So it was taken over by Hamas. Abbas has lost most of his power. He is sitting there and being afraid of losing the next elections. If they're announced, and people are now asking him to lead the Palestinian state, but he's rather scared of this proposition. But if this Palestinian state actually gets created, then it will actually fulfill the expectations of all the organizations fighting for it. Why are we now talking about that state? Nobody was talking about that until the 7th of October. We are now because of Hamas terrorist attack. With their terrorist attack, they reactualized this question. And who's running now trying to negotiate? Those people who are supposedly fighting with terrorism, right? They sent two aircraft carriers to help control the whole process of creation, creating the Palestinian state. So the West is a rather naked king too. I'm for the fourth month here and I'm seeing it more and more, not even bringing how they dealt with us as a country. And it'll be curious to see who actually broke the Istanbul negotiations. Because on the 9th of April last year, Russia was still suggesting to sit down and negotiate. And I don't know, I don't have a physical answer, even though I was part of that negotiation group. I do not have an answer to this question. But if we decided to go into a long war, into a protracted war, and by the way, on the 2nd of April, we had only four MLRS missiles left. That was our longest reaching weapon at the time. Then I think if we went to this scenario, we went because we were calculating for something. So why did we have this calculation and why did it fall through? This is one of the biggest questions in our modern history, because today Patreos and Ben Hodges, they're saying that it's impossible to do any counteroffensive operations with such a lackadaisical uh, support by the West. And they're coming out and saying, no, the West didn't provide enough. So the question is why? The West didn't give enough. And why is the West still trading with Russia for half a trillion dollars, out of which half of uh, the money will probably fall on our heads as shells and missiles? You actually surprised me with half a trillion dollars, Alexei. I was talking to the experts of gas and oil market, and they gauged it at one billion a day uh, of an income for Russia last year, and this year is less. Right, Vasil, but it's not just oil and gas. This is everything that Russia was trading for in the last 10 months. I've seen this publication in the Western media. I'll find a link, don't have it in front of me. Okay, let's go to more questions. The next one is rather long, but I'll try to be quick. A question to you as a military expert. I'll use your quote that you used in different interviews that changes uh, aggregate slowly, but realize uh, rapidly. So do you think situations like Kharkov operation can happen in reverse when we lose Marinka, Avdeevka, and we worry about Donetsk region towns which are still far away from the front. No, Russia doesn't have these capabilities. This is the weakness of their position. And look, they've been accumulating troops to take Bakhmut for half a year. For Avdeevka, they've been also aggregating their troops for several months. And this is the fight for regional centers. This is the paradox of situation that even despite the strategic decisions they made to change the geopolitical framework to start up their military industrial complex and create new capabilities and biggest defense budget they are still incapable in to bring their army to a state where they can do operative level operations on the front with a scope of let's say 200 miles on the front they can only do a tactical level like Abdivka or even smaller than that and this is their Weak point, when people are asking, do you think Putin will even go for negotiations? Yeah, where, they, where else they'll go? They understand the weakness. They're also in a stalemate. We cannot win, but they cannot win as well. And this is the bloody grinder. It's just uh, they have long perspectives on this grinder because they have longer mobilization perspective and resource, and they have more natural resources. 
and now they're taking up Divka for the second month at the cost of huge losses. But the fact that they're still trying to get to the borders of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, and that will be resolved by military force, that I can guarantee. And it's just that if they decide to take Pakrovsk or Jasafyar or something, they will have to aggregate troops for another few months and then conduct a long three to four month campaign to occupy it. It's a long story. But this story doesn't have a long-term perspective for us because unless the West amps up the supplies of military equipment for us five times and will not tighten the sanctions against Russia maybe ten times more than it is now, then we cannot talk about any heroic liberation of our territories. And now, do you believe the West wants to change that? I'm telling you no. And what do you think will it do? I don't think they'll do anything. They'll continue guiding the same politics at least till the elections in the United States next year, so that in 24, Russia cannot win and Ukraine would not lose. And they will be giving us the minimum needed for us to hold the front. And in the meantime, Russia will be slowly growing their capability. So this is a very perspective-less situation for us. And it's a really bad situation looking at it from the West, because they're trading with Russia. They're basically providing Russia with chips and many other things that are supposedly sanctioned, but they're not really. So according to Lenin, they're selling, as proper capitalists, they're selling the rope that Russia will hang them on, right? And then they're not giving us enough resources that we can liber liberate our occupied territories. And they're also trying to keep the active uh, laborers, active workers on their territories. In Germany, they actually have a big program for assimilation of Ukrainian refugees. And they're telling us, uh, you know, they're kind of skipping it and hinting at it in conversations. You know how the fight between Russia and Ukraine looks like from the Western side? It looks like two heathens are fighting in mud. And a lot of people are cheering and watching that. Russia is paying with resources, we're paying with people. Both sides are paying with blood and they're making money. And I'm not exaggerating, not repeating Moscow propaganda here. I'm making conclusions while I'm traveling and observing what's happening here with my own two eyes. All right. You said if we want to, we can talk about negotiations, maybe. I really don't want to talk about that, and I can explain why. Initially, I referenced the Ukrainian security service that is saying that um, Russian agents are pressing through mass media on the topic of negotiations. So I'll stay cautious here and let's skip the negotiations topic. That's fine. I don't have a task to promote negotiations. If I'm asked, I can answer, but otherwise let's skip it. A question from our viewer. Why don't we put enough Patriots and RSTs and when we start uh, and then also start cereal production here in Yuzhmash or somewhere. Right, exactly. So in the United States, they have 1,100 patriots on active duty, and they have 400 patriot systems stored. To save the whole situation in Ukraine, we need 50. They give us one patriot a year, a quarter. Yeah, right, that's a saving grace indeed. So you know that picture when the West really supports us in all, in all they can to stop that black horde of Russia? No, nothing like that. They're just uh, wasting Russian resources as much as they can and they're earning dividends on it. The West is a naked king. And there are adequate people who are seriously regretting what's going on. Hodges, Walker, Petraeus and the others, but they're not defining politics. These are ex-military, they're retired, and they can afford themselves to make statements. And the ones in power, they are just making money and doing business as usual and feeling themselves fine. So, next question from our viewers to continue that same push. Earlier, Alexei was accusing West in slow walking the military supplies, and now his rhetoric has changed. What do you mean? How did that change? What I was talking about right now, right? I'm talking about exactly that. So let's cancel this question as inadequate, right? Okay. 
Is it true that before the beginning of full-scale military campaign of Russia and Ukraine, American intel indeed uh, transferred information to our to Ukrainian leadership about that probability? It was a difficult situation. Vasil, on one hand, as uh, Western media is publishing, Hershey and the other journalists who are publishing a lot, they sound roughly like this, that on one hand, Americans gave full information, but I have questions, because people who are related to that information in Ukraine, they said they didn't have full information, they had estimates. And estimations are not information, that's different. Because estimation is Vasya may conduct a stream with Aristovich, and information is Vasily is planning to conduct a stream at 8 p.m. on Sunday. So, second thing, on the 26th of October, I think, uh, of 21, I was in the studio there. I'll need to clarify the exact date, but it was the end of October. Budanov, the head of um, Intel, who was visiting Washington at that moment, actually said that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. And they showed a map that uh, people considered to be funny with different arrows. And uh, actually these arrows were roughly the directions that Russia attacked Ukraine from. And he came out with this. He put that in a public light. And Reznik was at that time telling, uh, in his, telling in his interviews that a month after, in December, he was uh, begging the Minister of Defense of the United States to give us some stingers. This is nothing for a big continental warfare. And how Austin was holding his head and saying, what stingers? This is difficult. This is such a rough waving of balance. And it may uh, rock the boat and may change situation with Russia. So let's ask the question, what did the West supply us before the beginning of big war? When they were warning us about this war, uh, this war for existence of Ukraine? Nothing. A couple hundred javelins, a couple hundred stingers, that's it. So what did they want when they were actually letting us know that uh, there are some prognosis about it, that there will be a war? So you remembered about Budanov. What do you think about the poisoning of his wife? I think internal services, security services of uh, ministries should figure it out. It's difficult to gauge on the outside. On one hand, it's a sensational information. On the other hand, what's going on if you can, one can poison the wife of uh, our chief of intel? Then there's a lot of questions coming out of it. So let's see how that unfolds. Next question from you, or do you think we're too big for joining European Union? So Ukraine as Turkey can just destroy the whole agricultural sector of Europe? Oh, it doesn't seem to me that's what European press is publishing. And European parliamentaries and leaders of different parties are talking about. Look at the customs wars that are happening between the borders of European Union and Ukraine, where we are not even anywhere and haven't even brought anything there yet. Yes, we are guilty, partly, in this customs uh, conflict, because we decided, some people decided to make money. But the presence of these conflicts shows that the pressure is huge. And the estimation is that, yeah, indeed, if uh, Ukraine gets there, the pressure on the agricultural sector in Europe will be huge. And they're now subsidizing their sector up to 30%, I think. So in our propaganda, we are conducting negotiations with EU. What are the real perspectives, though? And recent publication about countries willing to join EU went down from 88 to 86. A little bit, but still. Do you think that people understand that countries start to understand that it's not so smooth? That is maybe just a beautiful fairy tale that's being fed, but real perspective is so far out, even if it's possible at all. Okay, let's go further. Another question from the viewer. Alexei, did Russian Secret Service ever try to recruit you? Let's ask Russian ser services. Russian services, why didn't you try to recruit me? Another question is how would they do that on the compromising materials, on connections, on money? There is a formula called DIX in the English. Uh, it sounds funny, but it, it's easy to 
remember it. Money, ideas, compromise material, connections. And ideally they should have been using that, right? But where are they? <laughs> They're not using it. Maybe here, under the table. <laughs> no, nobody. Right? Alexei, do you think that Vysotsky's phrase, there is not enough real madmen, do you think um, the problem of cadre hunger is real for Ukraine? How do you and where do you plan to find the right cadre for rebuilding of the country? And there are all kinds of services in Ukraine, customs, judicial system, and they all are aimed at uh, punishing the citizens, not uh, at servicing the citizens. And I apologize for this long question, but yeah, you just need to change rules and change old rules to new ones and people with other motivations will come. Please, can you provide longer answers that I was reading the question? Um, yeah, but that's it, what it is, Vasil. That's how you do. You just change the rules and it uh, brings the right people. Who built the strongest special services of Israel and their intel? You think people who moved to Israel in the mid-20th century were specialists and all that? No, they had teachers, agrarians, uh, scientists, but they formulated the tasks and they managed. Guys, those who are writing huge questions on the whole page uh, and are not surprised that I haven't read it, please, uh, it's the time frame of the show, I cannot be reading it for five minutes. <laughs> so try to formulate it sharper and uh, shorter. Um, next question, what can people who are not inside Ukraine do to help the Ukrainian front besides donations? Well, perhaps hold the information front and explain their friends and relatives what is Ukraine fighting for and why can it not continue fighting and that the solution to this war is laying in a different pain uh, that we're trying to be sold. Do you think United Nations or some other third party troops may be brought into Ukraine to freeze the war? Um, we did not want to talk about negotiations, right? But we kind of need to address that because negotiations we're talking about is not about Ukraine agreeing with Russia to give up some territories. The only exit out of this situation is huge um, multilateral security system negotiations because the old system doesn't work anymore. Potsdam system was preventing armed conflicts in Europe since 45 to 89 of last century. Uh, the peak of that system was in 79 when they signed the document about uh, unchangeable borders in Europe. And after that, and in 89, the biggest war in Europe started um, in Yugoslavia. Um, not as big as Second World War, of course, but it was a serious war. And then the Soviet Union fell apart. There was another set of wars. And now there is a war with Ukraine and other threats uh, in Baltic countries and Lithuania and Poland and Balkans and all. That means very simple thing. The previous system of rules is not working anymore. The players have changed. The motivation system has changed. The logic of the players has changed. The threads have changed. So one needs to sit down at a big table, put all their cards on the table and come to agreements, looking at all the conditions and create a system that will provide enough security for the whole world. Uh, we should be looking at the whole world, but maybe if not, the world doesn't work, at least uh, we can do the Europe. And the questions of NATO, the borders and everything, these are secondary questions. They'll be decided in an overall system of collective security. And they're important, but the security system is first. It needs to be created and it needs to be working. Because until you do that, the wars will continue in perpetuity until, you know, one side fully uh, loses or both sides uh, waste uh, enough resources that they want to negotiate. But they won't be utter loss now because the West now has parity in uh, long-range uh, missiles and technologies and Russia has uh, advantage in willingness to lose as many people as they want. If they want to achieve their tasks, they will, they're ready to sacrifice 2 million. Is the West ready to sacrifice at least a million? And we'll be fighting in perpetuity until we drain our resources, unless we sit down and figure out the new security system, because otherwise it's a war for 15 years and a complete crash of economies and everything. But this is not a separate uh, peace agreement with Ukraine and figuring out 
how Russia and Ukraine can uh, negotiate over the territories. This is a whole new agreement in Europe with all the parameters to define the borders, define the areas of influence. Uh, it, I'm not suggesting, hey, Putin, these are some lands for you, let's uh, take, make peace. No, we need to put the question at large as a big security system. All right, friends, we have over 39,000 watching us live and only have 9,000 clicks uh, of the like button. I was holding for the whole stream, but I am going to ask you now. So please, uh, you know, nine only nine out of 39 are clicking the like button. That's the answer to the question, what can you do on your level? Click the like button. You'll send it uh, to more people to see. Can we do a few more questions? Yeah, we can try. Are there people in Ukraine who can break the system and build a successful country? Yes. Can you ask Aristovich, please? He stopped talking about elections in Ukraine during war because he thinks it'll be deadly for Ukraine or because the continuation of these talks will be political death for Aristovich. I'm not interested in my political career, friends. I'm not uh, a politician whom you used to deal with. I'm not going to say nice words in order to win on the elections. And I think in the last few months you could, you had a good chance to uh, see that. I talked about topics that uh, I did break a lot of uh, followers from me. If uh, at some point I will achieve enough support by saying the truth and that uh, I will have enough support to act on truth, that's fine. If not, um, who will be worse, you know, who will be worse off? I'm okay here, looking around, and who will actually be worse off if these things will not be happening, if these changes will not be happening, that people need to have their rights, so businessmen would not be extorted, so people would not be grabbed and thrown to the front without any training, so that the West would not just blatantly make money on us. Who will be doing that? Another question, um, not a global, but people were asking, Alexei, do you think uh, we need Christmas trees in cities and villages? Absolutely. As uh, somebody who is uh, dabbling in psychology, the more people are doing their usual things and leading their usual lives, the better it is for their psyche and psyche of society in general. So Christmas celebrations, ice skating, different activities, of course, with uh, you know, looking at the military warnings and uh, air raid warnings, but still, this is all important. So, it is not right that you are just going to be somewhere and not do anything because the guys are in the front. The guys are in the front, so you could lead uh, usual lives, and the guys in the front understand that that that's what they sacrifice for. They are there so that you could live normal lives as much as it's possible. So. It's uh, something, it's a family holiday, and people who want to reset their psyche, reload a little bit, and refresh themselves, please do it. And a question may be posed to the government, and why we even we have such a question, that we should be limiting our celebrations. This is wrong, we should not be posting questions like that. Have you seen at least one American military who sent a video from Iraq saying why you guys are celebrating Thanksgiving or Christmas while we are dying here? That never happens. The civilians actually sending thank you messages to military, military sending uh, their regards and civilians and families send their support packages of different goods. So the symptom of not celebrating is a bad symptom for society and uh, central leadership should take care of that. Well, yeah, American troops in Iraq is different. We have a war in our territory. Still, regardless, on the psychological level, to lower the PTSD effects, the more civilians maintain their usual civil life, the better it is. All right, another question from the viewer. Does Alexei consider anyone to be a traitor to Ukraine? You know, um, we too quickly jump at things and claim each other to be a traitor and blame uh, people around. Even when uh, I would fall on the judicial system here, because you need proper proof and you cannot even call somebody a traitor until it is proven in uh, court. People are too easily dropping words around. You, Vasily, is a traitor. I'm Alexei, is a traitor. People are posting that in chat. Everybody is a traitor, right? There'll be just traitors all around, only the traitors who uh, sold us to different parties. 
So I can describe not even the exact people, but the layers of uh, activities that lead to traitorship. And I could give names, but I would rather just call the societal layers rather, instead of uh, putting the real names. How about that? So people who, for example, are engaged in corruption, they are killing Ukraine. Those people who are creating that lubok, that uh, inflated propaganda that detaches people from reality, they are killing Ukraine and they're also acting against national security, against Ukraine and our interests. These are two categories. And they're tightly connected between each other because it's easier to steal when you put Ukrainian shirt on and uh, scream something pat patriotic. All that hate in the networks uh, against you, Alexei, does it help you or does it uh, bother you? People, I was never upset at the patients. Alexei, what did you need the false start of the presidential campaign for? Who said I even started my presidential campaign? Well, you made a statement that you will participate in elections. Oh yeah, I made a statement even in Gordon's interview a year ago. Well, back then you said it a little differently. Still, I said that when there will be elections, I will go if, if you said if, if uh, Zelensky will not go. Right, I was uh, still serving the office of the president, so I could not undermine the president, but now I'm a free citizen. So it's a different situation and I can say as I think. And I did not uh, start my campaign, I did not record a whole video and start the thing, guys, I am starting my campaign, I'm going to liberate you from oppression and all. No, I was asked a question during the interview and I answered the question. I started the only campaign of truth, of bringing our people to reality, which may be related to a political campaign, but it's not linear and it actually is harming my percentage, by the way. A memorandum signed by congressmen that elections will be held at the end of uh, military actions. What is that? Oh, that's their fear to not be re-elected and to answer for things in the judicial systems. Well, look, when they cannot divide responsibilities between commander-in-chief and superior commander, they still haven't got their stuff together to do it. But when they need to talk about re-elections, all of a sudden they find agreements. Those fractions who are attacking and fighting with each other all the time, suddenly they are together and signing the document saying no elections until the end of war. So apparently they can gather together on the principal questions. Unfortunately, the principal question is re-election for them and not the surviving of the country. All right, our reviewers are asking, what if the military situation continues for another 10 years? God forbid, but you know, still. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Those people who are saying elections are bad, don't do it during war. Okay, what if we are doing it for another 10 years? You don't want free elections? That's what's going to happen, what people don't understand. In May of this year, 26% of uh, respondents answered here in Ukraine that uh, to the question, can you criticize power? They said, uh, yeah, 26% said, yes, you can. In October, 70% said, yes, you can. You know what it means? It means delegitimation of uh, power. So they are losing their legitimacy. And all the processes are being supported by legitimacy. High legitimacy can actually overstep some of the ju judicial systems elements. Remember, during Maidan, they even created a third stage of elections, which uh, is not in the constitution, right? But it was uh, so supported by society. So the problem is that when power loses legitimacy, it loses its capability to impress difficult and popular decision on the society. And during war, you need a lot of unpopular decisions to just survive. For example, to lower the recruitment age. Now they're discussing from 30 to 25. There'll come time when you'll need to bring it down to 18, if we'll continue in the same framework. In the next three years, not even three, uh, not even 10 years, three years, we'll be dropping it down to 18. Mothers of those uh, guys who will be recruited, do you really want that age to be dropped to 18? that decision will have to be enforced on you. And it's only the power that can, uh, that you trust, that has enough support, can enforce that. And if uh, they don't, they can't. And here is a very simple logic. Those people who are against the elections and who are blaming us for bringing up this topic. Power, uh, power needs to make uh, certain unpopular decisions. 
unpopular decisions, although lead to survival of the nation. If there are no unpopular decisions, the nations will not survive. Do you think that's a fair price to pay for not holding the elections? I was in the presidential office and I left it first time on the 17th of January of uh, 21st. Well, on the 23rd, I also left it on the 17th of January. It was an interesting coincidence, but at the beginning, the rating of a president in 21 was lower than 24, and it was dropping. And it was relatively peacetime. We were preparing for war, but uh, the war hasn't started yet. And I remember those meetings, and you could see two very sharp tendencies. Middle bureaucrats and regional powers, they stopped responding to presidential orders. They were just not doing anything. There was paralysis. Presidential power stopped working. Formally, the orders were given, but nobody was doing that. And it's just 24%. And if you drop lower, imagine what happens. Plus, all the political opponents started to get together and discuss how can they get rid of Zelensky. So presidential rating is now dropping down. Half a year from now, it will be even lower. If he was uh, pure gold and the best we could find, it would have been still uh, going down because uh, coffins, dead people, missiles falling on our heads, that doesn't add any optimism. And given that the Congress and uh, the office of the president are not too brilliant, that means that their um, leadership will be falling. And at some point, their orders will stop being executed in the country that fights an active war. So how do you like that perspective? When the vessel is going down, but captain's orders are not being carried out. What does it end with? With panic and with war of everybody against everybody and very quick sinking of the boat. And is it such a horrible price to pay for the elections? Just answer this question yourselves. Dear friends, we crossed the mark of 40,000 live viewers right now. And uh, once again, I'll remind you to not forget to subscribe to Alexei's channel, to Vasil channel and to the privateer station that is bringing all these conversations to you in English. And you'll find links for donations at the bottom of this video. So please do that if you can, if you can support, please do this. And that's it for the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. Until next week. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexei, please take care. Likewise, Vasil. See you.